I love being a priest. I can't think of anything that I'd rather do in my entire life, which is amazing to think about because I never wanted to be a priest. Not as a kid, not even as an adult. When I was a kid, I didn't even want to be an altar server, didn't want anything to do with church. As a teenager, as a college student, I started to learn about my faith, but I didn't want to serve in that way. Even after I joined the Friars, I was prepared to take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. I still wasn't sure if I was called to be a priest. And there are lots of reasons for this, you know, a whole journal full of reasons of why I might not be called to this. But if I think about it, and I'm honest with myself, the thread that ran through all throughout my life was a sense that I was unworthy. How could I do that? I thought of myself as a sinner, and I know we're all sinners, but you know, I, I was a sinner. Never murdered anyone, never did anything terrible, but how could I stand before other people and say, don't do that, when I struggled with sin? I couldn't do it. I thought about all the teachings of the church and how few of them I actually knew. I didn't understand our theology. I'd never read the Bible. How could I stand up and teach people things that I didn't understand or maybe even believe myself? No, I, I cannot do this. I am unworthy of that position. Even just the practicality of preaching in front of people and going through the sacraments and all the gestures and the motions and just the things you do, the way you give of yourself. I looked at these heroic priests and just thought, man, I am not that strong. I don't have that much energy. I can't do those things. I am not worthy to be a priest. Yes, I will say for many years, this is what held me back. And it's why I actually find our first reading from the Mass this weekend, the story of the, the widow, the widow that was very poor, that actually maybe changes my mind on that. And I think that there might be something to offer you. You know, on National Vocations Awareness Week, the, the poor woman from you know, the first book of Kings, the widow, is not usually a poster child for vocations. Most people don't talk about her. But there's something about her story that really struck a chord with me this week, really I think, spoke to me as my own vocation. You see, if you remember, it was in the middle of a drought, middle of a terrible famine, and here comes Elijah coming up to this widow, a widow who has no power in the ancient world. Not only is she a woman, but she has no one to protect her. And he comes up into her and says, give me a glass of water. <laughs> my first thought is this woman is much holier than I am because I would not have been generous. Sir, who, the, who do you think you are? It's the middle of a drought. No, you get yourself some water. I would not have been as nice. But she gives him some water, finds him a cup of water. And then, you know, who's this guy, Elijah, how bold he is, says, now make me a cake. <sighs> I would have lost it then. Uh, no, who do you think you're talking to? Absolutely not. But she says, very tragically, I wish I could. But you know, I only have a cup of flour left. There's just a little bit of oil. And I'm about to go make a fire, and I'm going to use that. And when I eat that with my son, that's going to be our last meal. And then I'm going to die. This was the tragedy of the situation. This is the, the difficulty that people were facing. And Elijah was in the midst of it. But Elijah pushed on. The, the, this guy, oh my gosh. But she's, she did. She did, despite the fact that she had nothing to give. She gave him something with the promise that God would protect her. She just had his word. She didn't know who this guy was from a foreign nation, but she trusted. She trusted that there could be something beyond herself. What's amazing is she didn't know who Elijah was. She didn't know the incredible works that God was going to work through this guy, performing miracles, announcing the kingdom, denouncing the evil prophets. She didn't know that. But because she had faith in God, she was able to give the little bit that she had, just a cup of flour, a little bit of oil, and in some ways play a part in salvation history. Think about that. If she would have only thought of herself, which would have been completely understandable, just said, I, I got to survive. I've got to eat. If she would have only thought of herself, maybe Elijah would have died. Maybe he would have died of starvation. And then think about all the things that God would not have accomplished. Think about the, the effect that she had on God's salvation. How incredible it is that all she had was a little bit and God was able to transform that into something extraordinary. That's the story of salvation.
It's the story of all the prophets. Think about, you know, my story. It's so cliche. Oh, I'm not worthy. Yeah, okay, get, get behind the rest. Moses said it, and David said it, and Isaiah said it, Mary Magdalene said it. God never chooses the fully formed, never chooses the people who have everything put together. How many times he picked kings or queens in the Bible? Very infrequently. He picks the people that you and I would not choose. He picks you and I. And he asks us to give the little bit that we have so that he can transform it. It's so funny. I think about it so often. I mean, how silly we are when we think that we're not worthy. We couldn't do that. We give ourselves way too much credit. It's not too little credit. Too much credit to think that the salvation of the world, to think that great acts depend on what we can offer it. Do you really think that we're depending on you? Is God depending on me? I don't think so. If we look to the second reading this weekend, we see the letter to the Hebrews, a beautiful, beautiful letter, very complicated at times, but there is this thread through it that I think is so important. If you take nothing away from the letter of the Hebrews except this, I think you'll learn something, which is that Jesus is a high priest in a very different way than the priests of the earth, particularly the priests of the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus was pure. He wasn't sinful like the others. He was sinless, and so he offered the sacrifice not for himself first and then the people, but just himself. He didn't sacrifice bulls, didn't sacrifice living animals. He sacrificed his very body and blood, making him the altar and the sacrifice and the priest all at one time. And of course, he didn't have to do this over and over again, each and every day needing a new sacrifice. He offered himself once for all, for all eternity. That was the sacrifice that completed everything. This is the theology of our Mass. It's the theology of me as my priesthood. That when I get up and say, this is my body, this is my blood, when I celebrate the Mass and offer these offerings, it's not my power. Those aren't my words. It's God working through even me, a sinful man, even me, a weak man, even me who forgets the words sometimes. God is able to take that cup of flour that I can offer and make something extraordinary out of it. It's that revelation that kind of hit me sometime after I joined the Friars, and everything kind of opened up to me. I wrote it down in my journal. It was actually a passage from one of Pope Benedict's books. He said, in this prayer, the priest speaks with the eye of the Lord. This is my body. This is my blood. He knows that he is not now speaking from his own resources, but in virtue of the sacrament that he has received, he has become the voice of someone else who is now speaking and acting. And I don't know exactly why that hit me, but that right there was the turning point. The title of that passage is, I want to be a priest. Because it was that that got me over the sense of unworthiness, the sense that I am not good enough. And I accepted that I'm not. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. But that doesn't mean that God can't still use me. Because it's not about my holiness or my strength or my wisdom that makes the sacraments happen. It's not me who brings salvation, but Christ. And so all I have to do is offer that little bit of flour, and God will do tremendous things with it. And I think it's a challenge to each one of us. First of all, for all of us baptized Christians, of course, we have something to offer. There is no excuse to say, oh, I can't offer anything. Yes, yes you can. Each and every one of us, by virtue of our baptism, has been given the grace of God and the ability to be priest, prophet, and king, and so we must take up that charge. But you know, some of us are called to something sp particular, something special, maybe. I do think that God chooses some from among the baptized to be priests in a ministerial sense, to be prophets, to be kings in, a, in an ordination sense, in a hierarchical sense, to serve in a particular way. I do think that there are some set apart for a particular purpose, and it's not because they're holy, but because God is holy in them. And so I want to ask for you at home who think, I'm unworthy, I could never do that. Oh, he's too holy. Oh, she's so much better than me. It's not about them. It's about God and what God can do in you. And maybe God is calling you to the priesthood or to the diaconate or to religious sisterhood or brotherhood. Maybe God is calling you to give everything you have, just like the widow. Maybe it doesn't matter how little that is, the fact that you're giving it all, and not to a wife or a husband, not to a family, not to a job, but to this life in God. Maybe that's enough for God to save the nations, to do extraordinary things. 
I want you to really consider this. I didn't think that I could, and I imagine you don't either, but you can. If God is calling you, that's all that matters. I invite you to seriously consider in prayer to offer that cup of flour. Some of you are called. But some of you are not, of course. Some of you I know are not, and we all can't be called in this way. That's not to say better or worse, but simply we can't all be priests. That wouldn't be a great nation. We need some lay people. We need some families. We need people that go out into the world. There are different vocations, but that doesn't mean you're off the hook. That doesn't mean that you can say, well, I do whatever I want now. No, maybe you're not Elijah. Maybe you're not the great prophet that's going to announce things in a particular way, but you can still be the widow. Think about her witness. She didn't save the nation. She didn't preach. She didn't do, perform extraordinary miracles, but she allowed someone else to do that. She played a part in someone else's vocation. And so I wonder with you, maybe you're already married. Maybe you just, you're not called to this. Maybe you can find someone who is. Maybe there's someone in your life who needs a little cake, someone who needs some water, and you could be the one who provides it. You could be the one to say, hey, have you ever thought about this? You're a really good preacher. You're a very compassionate person. You're a good leader. You know, prayer is so important to you. Have you ever considered doing this for the rest of your life? The church needs you. I need you. Have you ever been the widow for someone else, encouraging them? It's an extraordinary vocation in and of itself. Even if you are not becoming the priest, you get to play a part in that priest's vocation, in that religious sister's vocation. It may be all that you can offer. Maybe you can't be a priest, but you can offer that cup of flour that you do have. You can let God do extraordinary things through you. My brothers and sisters, this National Vocations Awareness Week, I want to encourage each and every one of you to take vocations seriously, to think about the wonderful things that you can do in your life, maybe giving your life yourself or maybe encouraging others to give theirs. We are a church. We are a people that are in love with God, and I don't want to see that go away. We have a call to live out our baptism, and we can do this in many ways. May it be encouragement. May it be in prayer. May it be giving everything we have, knowing that God will do the rest. May God give you his peace.